This is CNN 10, your down the middle explanation of world news, and I'm Carl Azus. Always happy to have you watching. We're getting started in Eastern Asia today, where the leader of Hong Kong is doing something she previously said she wouldn't do. She's getting rid of a controversial government bill that led to massive protests that started three months ago. Hong Kong is a special administrative region of China. People in Hong Kong have certain freedoms that people in mainland China don't have. An extradition bill proposed earlier this year would have allowed Hong Kong to hand over certain crime suspects to mainland China. Critics were concerned this could be done for political reasons, that people who spoke out against Hong Kong or China's government could be sent off to the mainland. Both Hong Kong and China said that wouldn't happen, and the bill was put on hold. But Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, has until now refused to get rid of the bill entirely. Well, she just did, saying that after more than two months of social unrest, it's obvious that the discontent in the city goes beyond the bill and that Hong Kong must look for solutions to its problems. Protests have grown increasingly violent in recent weeks, but getting rid of the extradition bill may not stop them. The focus has now completely shifted to allegations against police, allegations against protesters, People are be getting divided within the community as to who's right, who's wrong. The extradition bill was one of five main demands protesters had made. But Chief Executive Lam has refused to give ground on the other four, which include more democracy for the city. Lam says the government's priority is to restore law and order. We don't know what's next here. Mainland China has indicated it could intervene, if necessary, to prevent riots. On Thursday and Friday, the eye of Hurricane Dorian is forecast to move near or over the coast of the Carolinas. Forecasters still aren't sure exactly where this slowly wandering storm will go, but they say flooding, especially in coastal South Carolina's low country, could be devastating. Last night, Dorian was a Category 2 storm with wind speeds a little over 100 miles per hour. It doesn't look like it caused too much major damage in Florida, but it's a very different story in the northern Bahamas, where Dorian hit as a Category 5 hurricane on Sunday and hovered for days. It's not known yet how many people there were killed, but there's a major problem for the organizations and countries planning to send aid supplies. We are on the runway at the Freeport Airport. It has been inaccessible for days. There was a river between the rest of the city and this airport, it was completely underwater. It looked like the waves were crashing, waves were crashing against this airport. Look how destroyed it is right now. Just about every side, eight feet to 10 feet up, has been leveled, ripped in, torn in. Look at it now. I don't recognize it. There is not a wall standing. You think about the need this island has right now for a functioning airport to get injured people out, to get supplies in, and this airport right now is completely destroyed. I've never seen anything like it in my life. This is complete and utter devastation like I've never seen. Jose's gonna point the camera over here. Look at this, that's a wheel. This is the underside of a plane this is what's left of the wing. You think of the force required to throw a plane from the runway into a terminal. If anybody was here, I don't know how they would have survived. I've seen a lot of damage on this island. This is the absolute most devastated area I have seen so far. It will be impossible for anybody who is injured or just wants to get off the island to leave from here. Aid will not be able to come in to this part of the airport, into this airport at all, because it's just a debris field now. So if help is gonna come, it's gonna have to come through some other way, boats, another airfield, but this is really the only air, this is the only airfield for this island, and it is in utter ruins. Up next, $170 million. That's what the technology company Google has agreed to pay to settle a lawsuit involving its YouTube video sharing website. Google owns YouTube. And the website was accused of collecting user information from kids in order to get more advertising revenue. Here's the problem with that. 
it's against the law in the United States for companies to use or share the personal data of kids under age 13 without their parents' permission. The government says Google and YouTube intentionally broke that law by tracking and providing specific ads to young children. The fine that Google's agreed to pay is the highest penalty ever paid for breaking that law. Google says it's committed to giving children and families the best possible experience on YouTube and that it plans to limit its data collection on videos made for kids, limit the features available on kids' videos, and stop serving personalized ads on kids' videos. Critics say the settlement isn't as effective as it should be in making sure YouTube will enforce its rules, and that even though the fine is a record, it's still less than 1% of what Google makes in advertising every quarter. A U.S. government representative says the settlement could still encourage businesses to make sure they follow the law. 10 second trivia. Which of these celestial objects is called a minor planet? Pluto, asteroid, moon, Sirius. Asteroids are also called minor planets, objects that orbit the sun but are neither planets nor comets. NASA and the European Space Agency are teaming up to see if they can throw an asteroid off course. In three years, a certain asteroid and its moon are expected to pass between Earth and Mars. Scientists are hoping to smash a spacecraft into the smaller rock and then take measurements to see if the collision was able to change the moon's orbit around the asteroid. Okay, why? They're hoping to find out whether it's possible to redirect an asteroid if one is on a collision course with Earth someday. The mission is estimated to cost NASA around $314 million. But it's not the space agency's only mission that involves an asteroid. The OSIRIS-REx mission, which sounds like a dinosaur, is an $800 million effort to bring a sample of an asteroid back to Earth. On New Year's Eve, a NASA spacecraft entered orbit around a near-Earth asteroid. It was the smallest object yet to be orbited by a spacecraft. And it all started with what you see here, the spacecraft OSIRIS-REx, and this asteroid called Bennu. The principal investigator for the OSIRIS-REx mission tells us his team believes that samples from Bennu can help shed some light on the building blocks of life on Earth. We think Bennu dates from the dawn of the solar system and contains water and organic material and our science objectives are really focused on understanding the role that these kinds of asteroids played in making Earth a habitable planet and possibly bringing the seeds for the origin of life. Three, two, one. And liftoff of OSIRIS-REx, its seven-year mission to boldly go to the asteroid Bennu and back. The mission of OSIRIS-REx started two years ago when it launched from Florida and is now orbiting the space rock about 500 meters wide that's just a little taller than the Empire State Building. For the next year and a half, the spacecraft will study Bennu from above. So far, it's already discovered water on the asteroid. Then another milestone planned for July 2020. We're gonna go through a very rigorous process of mapping, data analysis, and then simulation and testing to make sure that the spot that we picked is just exactly right for this mission. OSIRIS-REx will reach out its 11-foot robotic arm and make contact with Bennu for about five seconds to retrieve a sample. That is really going to be a very delicate maneuver where we fly our spacecraft into the surface of the asteroid to collect that material. If you're staying inside a lodge, you'd think you'd be protected from some of the wildlife that prowls around outside. It's not exactly how it went recently at a lodge in Big Sky, Montana. A black bear made its way inside the ladies' bathroom and then decided to take a nap on the sink. The lodge says the animal got in through a window. Police and wildlife officials were able to tranquilize the bear and then move it to a more appropriate location. Were the bears welcome? There were no ur signs that said so, and taking naps outside gives them much more restroom, so that's something to think about. The story generated Ursa major interest, but no injuries were brought to bear, so the officers deserve some serious Kodiak accolades. I'm Carl Azus. Thanks for bearing with me on CNN 10.